We're going to be talking this afternoon about paradoxes. I'll explain the meaning of that in just a moment, but first let's ask God to direct our thinking. Father in heaven, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for Jesus who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This afternoon, as we discuss paradoxes, help us to understand the nature of truth and to understand how we may best relate to Christ. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, paradoxes. The word paradox is, uh, well, a paradox. <laughs> the word paradox is a bit confusing because some people, by paradox, mean that which contradicts itself. You know, black is white. Well, obviously black is not white. But paradox, when it's properly used, it really means uh, two principles of truth, both being true, but each one requiring that it connect with the other in order to be, in order to convey the full truth. In other words, uh, two principles that depend upon each other. And I will, this afternoon, I will share uh, a little bit about the background of how I came uh, to um, discover the issue uh, that I'm going to discuss with you, and, and that is the nature of truth, the paradoxical nature of truth. When I was a young man, still in college, I found a book on paradoxes, and uh, that book was very interesting to me, and it dealt with the obvious paradoxes of Scripture. If, if a man will save his life, he must lose it, and, and so forth. Now, those paradoxes, that's a real paradox, but to save one's life has to do with the eternal life, and to must lose it, we must, we must lose, be willing to lose our life here to have eternal life later. And it can have other meanings, such as death to self. If we want to have eternal life, we must uh, choose to deny self, or die to self. Uh, those paradoxes I found very interesting, but they were simply a, 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 a means of getting me started thinking paradoxically. And that means that I began to uh, look at issues and think to myself, in the various issues, what are the paradoxical principles? Now, no one had told me that paradoxical principles were, were universal, but as I r discussed these things with friends, as I probed them, I came to a realization that truth itself is paradoxical. It took a little while for me to fully grasp that. I was a young minister, probably about the second year of my pastorate, when I came to the realization that all truth is paradoxical. Furthermore, I discovered that if you really want to understand uh, principles of truth, the best place to do so is at the point of paradox, where it looks like this and this are opposite. And it seems hard to understand how they can come together. But that is where you dig, if you really want to discover truth on a deeper level. Most people, uh, their knowledge of truth has to do with what they hear, what they read, and uh, what people tell them, what they dis discuss in their classes, and so forth. But I believe God wants us to learn to think and not be mere reflectors of other men's thoughts. And if we understand the nature of paradox, it gives us the, uh, the basis upon which to do real thinking. And uh, so it also will help us to understand people 
who are in conflict or groups who are in conflict. When I was a young man, I began to realize that uh, within our own church, we had opposite parties forming. And each party was convinced that the principles they dealt with were essential, and each party was somewhat fearful of the other. And uh, and as a matter of fact, it wasn't that they denounced the other principle, it's simply that they subordinated it. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. But when you subordinate one truth to another, you actually prevent the subordinated truth for speaking from it for itself. You, you actually force it into a, a, a affirmation of the other that does not delimit the other. But where you have two poles of truth, each pole is equally true, but neither is truly, it's not the whole truth unless it connects with the other because it's the other truth that gives it the proper basis for understanding that that we can talk about a little later on. But I thought I might uh, discuss with you a little bit further the uh, challenge that I faced. Now, fortunately, uh, I discovered the poles of truth uh, at beginning college, but in my first pastorate, it was pretty well developed. And by the time that pastorate was about halfway through, there was a major conflict uh, within the church. And that conflict was one that probably directed my attention more than any other issue that I've ever faced. Can you tell us what year that this was? The year, the, the year when I... I feel like I really uh, grasped the twofold, you know, the, the fact that truth itself is paradoxical was about 1956. And uh, I, I will share in another lecture uh, the story about that, but it involved uh, my uh, contact with the Jehovah's Witness, and in the, as a result of that, This helped bring to a climax and to a focus my own understanding of paradoxes. Now, it just happened that within the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there uh, there was a uh, uh, two men by the name of uh, Martin and Barnhouse. These two men, one was the editor uh, of a magazine, and the other was working for the magazine and was also a book writer, had written uh, already a couple of books on, uh, on the, um, uh, not sex, but uh, um, and not heresy, but, but um, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> the files are closed. Uh, right now. But anyway, um, uh, what was Bob Jones? What did they call that? Bob Jones? Yeah, you know, the one that led this group and and massacre uh, uh, groups. um, Cult, thank you. (laughs) Cult, yes. Uh, yeah, but cult is the word I wanted. Uh, I, I have to confess that my files get stuck sometimes, and very common words don't come out. Now, and, what year was this when this was going on? You, you said that. Well, when I was dealing with the Jehovah's Witness was about 1956. Well, the issue with the church. The and uh, yes, I'll be telling about that. Uh, that was at the very time where uh, Martin was preparing to write a book on Adventism as a cult. And uh, he decided to come to our headquarters 
He did what was right to do to get information direct. So it wasn't just what somebody said about Adventism, but what we actually taught and believed. He came to our headquarters in about 1955, I think, or it may have been 56, but he came to our headquarters and asked us if he could ask if he could have access to our files. And we said, yes, he told us what he was doing. It was up front with it. We said yes, and he asked if he could uh, have a, a conversation with some of our men. And in particular, he asked if he could have conversation with Leroy Froome. Now, it just happens, by the way, my name is Leroy, not by accident, but because of Leroy Froome. Uh, my mother, uh, when she was just a young girl, was in Boise, Idaho, and uh, Leroy Froome's father, who was a medical doctor, kind of took her under his wing, and uh, she became a, something of a part of the family. And just at that time, Leroy Froome was uh, beginning his uh, work as an editor. He was just a young man. My mother was very impressed. She probably didn't have much contact with him, but the family undoubtedly told her quite a bit about his work and about how he was doing. And actually, he was a, a bright young man who was, uh, uh, was making some special trails, you know, for himself. And uh, so she named me after Leroy Frum, and that made this issue a little more significant to me than it would have been otherwise. But Leroy Frum and, uh, 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 was one, uh, probably the one that they wanted to speak to, uh, especially because he had just uh, not too long before, a few years before, had finished his book, on uh, prophetic faith of our fathers, which uh, uh, the uh, evangelical groups had come to know, and uh, actually some of them were quite interested in, in that. It was very um, voluminous work, and so they asked for Leroy Froome. There were several of them, and he was one, but he kind of became the uh, the, the leader of, of that group. <coughs> what happened was he met together with three or four of our men and he brought to them a list of questions. And those questions had to do with the topics he planned to write on. And uh, he asked if, if we could give answers to those. And our men said yes, they took the questions uh, they had had some discussion already, but they took the questions and it seems as though they wrote must, much of the night. And by the next morning, they had quite a lot of, of, of information for him. And when Walter Martin read their responses, he was uh, nonplussed. He didn't know what to do because they had removed the claims that he was planning to make in his book, and they had answered nearly all the questions. He had ans they answered them in a manner which he would want to correct Adventists on and, and uh, insist that this is what they should believe. And lo and behold, he discovered that that is what they were teaching. Well, he had some decisions to make. He was immediately, he let them know, he said, well, you know, I'm you know, surprised and, uh, and I find that my, see, he had, uh, he had done a lot of research, uh, research before, but he was getting his research from those who were opposing Adventists and making claims which he assumed were right because they seemed to be fairly uniform in the charges made. But you know, that's not hard to understand because most of the charges made against Seventh-day Adventists were made way back in the 19th century uh, by one of our uh, ministers who left the church and uh, began writing against the church. And uh, he was, his work has virtually all the charges against Adventists since then have come right 
from that, not necessarily direct from his, but other books are written since then and they read the same charges. So those charges are very familiar to us, uh, but Walter Martin had no way of knowing that those charges, which would be different ones, would be doing the same thing because they were dealing with the same source where, where they got these charges. Virtually all charges to this very day are charges that were made in the 19th century, uh, beginning at the late part of the 19th century, about 1890, uh, and into the 20th century. At any rate, Walter Martin was perplexed. What was he going to do? He had a book publisher who had already written a contract with him because he was a well-known writer and he had written on the cults before. Indeed, in one of his books, he had included Adventism in that. It is interesting, however, that in, even in that book, his treatment of Adventism was not the same as with Jehovah's Witness and, and um, Mormons and, and, and others. It was obvious that he was aware that Adventists were of a different, a different order, but he still identified us as a cult. So when he began his discussion with them, uh, he immediately went back to his boss, <laughs> uh, uh, Barnhouse, Donald Barnhouse, uh, editor of Eternity magazine. When I first mentioned that, by the way, the word eternity was stuck, so I couldn't quite get that one. <laughs> but uh, he went back to him and uh, shared with him the dilemma. What, what are we going to do? Here, uh, he was actually commissioned by Donald Barnhouse and had a contract. Now, what's going to happen? Well, they had quite a few visits together, and uh, our men were invited to doc, uh, Dr. Donald Barnhouse's home. They spent days together, and eventually, uh, after many probing questions, Donald Barnhouse uh, was asked by us, and he recognized that there was, there was not the basis for a cult designation that he thought there was, and his own son asked him, Father, what are you going to do about it? So Donald Barnhouse gave some careful thought to it and prayerful thought to it and decided, well, I've got to do the honest thing. And so he published, uh, I can't remember, I think it was two or three articles uh, stating their discovery about Adventism and it was necessary for, uh, for Walter Martin to work out with the publisher a change of, uh, a change of, of, of direction. But what they decided to do was to continue doing that. But since the critics of Adventism had, uh, uh, it was Ken Wright was the man who did the 19th, 18th, 19th century uh, uh, challenge to Adventism. But since the critics had included a lot of statements from our, some of our men, which seemed to confirm Ken Wright's position, now the question is, what is Adventism? Is Adventism what our men are saying now, or what some of these quotations that uh, Walter Martin had in his files from some of our men, aside from the charges made by Kenwright. And uh, the, dis the decision was finally made that if Walter Martin was going to represent Adventism properly, that there would have to be uh, a, a written document that could be used to as assure the readers that this was our position. 
Because others would say, no, I, I read this quotation about, and so forth. Now, many of those were quotations which were true, but they, uh, but the difference in vocabulary, difference in terminology, and so forth, it would sound like they meant something to an evangelical who used the terms in a different way. It would seem to them as though they were saying something different than what they really were. Now, it's also true that uh, Seventh-day Adventism uh, has a sharp focus upon the law. Not all of our people recognize, and this is where we're going to be talking about paradoxes, not all of our representatives have adequately presented the paradox of truth, and it's easy because we believe that the law of God is still binding, which the scriptures clearly show. We believe the seventh day as a Sabbath, which is also very clearly biblical. We believe in these various things that all tends to focus upon the law. But salvation is not through the law. And no one is saved by keeping the law. We're saved by Christ. We're saved by the grace of Christ and we're saved by looking to Christ. And when we receive him, we receive his righteousness. But what is his righteousness? Well, the law is a reflection of his righteousness. The principles of his character, we'll be talking about principles uh, uh, in a little bit. But most people do not discriminate between facts and principles. And, and it creates great confusion. And I'm sure some of our own people have failed to adequately uh, portray that. But facts and principles are very different things. Yes? Now that you have facts and principles, could you share what you shared with me when we were having a dinner about the Sabbath and the... Uh, All right, the question... I, I was sharing uh, with you, ha had to do with a conversation with one of our own pastors uh, who had retired. His name was, was Leroy, by the way. Mine's Leroy. He has an extra E and pronounces it different. But he and I were good friends. And when I gave him a manuscript of a book I was then writing, it revolutionized his, his thinking. And... Uh, 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 brother, uh, I'm going to give a little story here, if, you, if you'd like, and, and it, but you hold me to your question in case I forget, because that happens sometimes. Uh, but <clears throat> what happened is that uh, there was, he was a retired pastor who had pastored in that district, and I was pastoring in an adjacent district, and uh, the young man who took his place had a completely different approach. He was focused on the opposite side of truth. Uh, my friend Leroy Holmes was focused primarily on the law, and it was important to him to emphasize obedience. And that's not wrong, that's okay. But when he read my documents, he discovered, yeah, he says, I, I am... Uh, I speak the language of the law, and my friend here speaks the language of grace. Both believe the same thing, but one had sermons week after week would emphasize importance of obedience. The other one emphasized the importance of grace. And the fact is, they belong together. And uh, he and the other pastor both self-diagnosed themselves in the same way. And the younger pastor, it was a very interesting experience because the younger pastor especially was excited about the results because he had been having a lot of conflict in his church with people who really would rather have had the older pastor still because they felt that he was teaching the truth. And this young man, they felt, was not teaching the truth because he wasn't teaching it the way the other man had. But as we, we met together every week to discuss these principles, because they were eager to get more saturated with the concepts, the one already retired but still in good health, still, still preaching, you know, uh, and that's been, um, well, close to about 20 years ago. So, uh, 
<clears throat> so he's up in years, but he's still in good shape. He just finished writing a book recently, um, an excellent book. But at any rate, uh, Leroy, who, who had decided that this was going to be, and he began preaching these very principles, and the principles, when he was asked to be the, the chaplain at cowboy camp meetings they were holding, and he would be their speaker, he decided this was the principle he was going to deal with. So he was really quite gung-ho, but when we sat down one week, uh, he turned to me and said, Leroy, uh, what, how, I don't know what kind of paradoxes are between uh, Sabbath and Sunday. Well, I said, there is none. It's a fact that God set aside, God created the world in seven days, and he set aside the seventh day as a Sabbath. There's nothing paradoxical about that. Paradox has to do with principles. And there's a great deal of difference between facts and principles. A fact is something that happened, or it's something that exists. It's a fact that we are in this room. We're not in some other room. And there's nothing paradoxical about it. We're not partly in one room and partly in the other. Nor are there two rooms that need to be combined in order for, to contain us. <laughs> it's just a fact. Uh, it's a fact that you have a nice car out there, and uh, if you should have an accident, that would be a fact. And that car would uh, not change unless some repairman took, uh, took it under, under control. Well, that would be a fact. There are many facts in life, but when I talk about paradoxes, I'm talking about truth. Truth is not a... F there are many facts of truth, but facts do not constitute truth. They just happen to be. But truth has to do with principles of life. Truth has to do with how God created us. Truth has to do with, uh, with, with the plan of salvation. Truth has to do with the fact that Christ died for the sinners. If Christ died for the sinners, that in itself establishes the law because if the law could be done away with, he wouldn't have to have died, because sin is a transgression of the law. Now, if sin is a transgression of the law, and the law is done away with, then sin is done away with. So, uh, the, the fact is, uh, people of all churches and faiths and political parties tend to focus on one pole of truth and others focus on the opposite pole of truth, and this creates great confusion. Today we have two basic parties, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Each one focuses on a very basic and important pole of truth. Democrats uh, focus on the corporate needs of, of society. Uh, their focus is not on individuals, but on on groups. Republicans, on the other hand, tend to focus on individual liberties and, uh, and individual uh, uh, things. Now, both are necessary. If we focus on either one or the other, we have a very imbalanced government. And our problem now to, in, our, in our political system is that we have individuals who are not listening to each other they're not seeking to understand life and principles of life and how they can best serve the people. Each one has a party that they are seeking uh, to defend. And they're willing in that process, they're not even aware of the fact that they subordinate the needs of the other. Both are doing the same, both do the same thing. And that makes it confusion. Only occasionally does a man rise to the level of a statesman. Now, a statesman is different from a regular politician. The regular politician does everything he can to keep his job <laughs> and, to, and to keep his people happy and, and to, um, well, nowadays, virtually all of, all of them enter the politics as 
common ordinary men and leave us millionaires. And, and there's something wrong with that kind of system. Very definitely wrong. But the way, the way pol politics functions today, it's very controversial because there is no clear uh, sense of principles to guide them and learning to understand how those principles relate to each other. Now, I've gone quite a ways from my initial discussion, but we're still talking about paradox. And I'm going to put on the board something here. <clears throat> the paradox, I use this to kind of help uh, understand. A paradox, the very basic principle of paradox, has to do with the two principles of life uh, here in this sinful world. One is law and obedience, and that's not just religious. That has to do with, uh, with civil government and, 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 and all. If there are no laws, then there's no protection of the individual or the corporate body. And if there are laws that are not upheld, and uh, if, if obedience isn't required, then uh, we still have our money stolen, we have our cars stolen, we have uh, wives taken, our children kidnapped, and so forth. So law and obedience is absolutely essential to the function of society, and every social group develops its own laws and demands obedience to those laws. They may vary a great deal, but there is no way for, for society to function without an understanding of the laws. Now, the laws properly understood are really principles. Not all laws reflect principles. They may reflect the desire of some group to control another group. Well, for instance, let's say, uh, well, the medical society maybe uh, have their agents in Congress to get certain laws passed that will prevent others from moving into their turf, or you understand, or it could be, uh, it could be the DARE Association, it could be any, any group is going to want to have things. Now, that doesn't mean the law passed for them is a principle. It may be uh, simply a means of cutting off somebody else and, and uh, making sure that the, the, that the money channel comes through the, the ones that have influenced the law. And that's one of the problems of Congress is that congressional men are uh, susceptible to the uh, uh, money that comes through improper channels. Uh, from those who want to make a great deal, maybe the pharmacies, uh, you know, whatever it might be. And um, most big business is more interested in the dollars than they are in principles. So, but the fact is that society itself has to have principles, uh, laws, they would base it on some principle, principle of preserving life, for instance, pres preserving property, uh, 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 and so forth. Laws that make it necessary for banks to keep account and have them open so they can't uh, uh, steal the money from people. It's things of that kind. Now that would be basing on, on a principle that's vital to all. Now the other part is the uh, uh, grace. The grace of God. Now if you break the law, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and uh, sin is a transgression of the law, which wages are death. So all of us, the Bible says, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, we all are faced with the death sentence. But Christ came and took our place. He became our substitute. And uh, he not only offers his grace, which means that we can be absolved of the guilt that we're really responsible for because Christ died for those sins. Therefore, he can absolve us from those sins and can give us faith 
to claim that grace. So, we have grace and faith, law and obedience. Now, although these don't always seem to be uh, in conflict, nevertheless, the way we're grown, we grow up and the focus we have is nearly always on one principle or the other. So, if I have grown up in a family that has a strong focus on law, and you are, have grown up in a family that's constantly focused on Christ's grace, especially if you have the theology that God's grace removes the law, and we're going to have trouble. We can't see things alike. And we may enter into conflict so that I'm defending law and you're defending grace. And neither of us have a proper perspective. But when you 